from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all, and welcome once again to another episode of The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast serving the figurative sculpture community worldwide. I'm your host, Jason Arkels, a sculptor and educator living and working in Florence, Italy, where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. Now, last week, The Sculptor's Funeral podcast aired my interview with the American sculptor Brian Booth Craig, and you guys loved it. Not only did the episode get a great response on social media, but the episode broke all previous records in terms of the numbers of listeners it attracted in a single day on the day of its release. In fact, it came close to doubling that number. I know a lot of that has to do with Brian Craig's own large following on social media, so if you are a new listener to The Sculptor's Funeral, welcome aboard, and I hope you enjoy what you find here. Meanwhile, many of my longtime listeners have been in touch to express how much they liked Brian's thoughtful and insightful conversation. Now, I mentioned last week that Brian and I sat down and had a conversation that lasted for over three hours, and last week's interview covered only a fraction of what was said. It was really difficult for me to strip the conversation down in order to, you know, stay on topic about Brian's education and career because the tangents the conversation took were fascinating. And so this week, I'm going to do sort of a part two to the interview where Brian and I cover a few different topics that I think you will enjoy listening to. And after this episode is done, if you want to hear even more from Brian, I highly recommend checking out the podcast Suggested Donation. Suggested Donation is the podcast for painters of the figurative tradition based out of New York and hosted by Edward Minoff and Tony Curanai, and they also interviewed Brian Booth Craig, and that episode premiered just a few days ago. I listened to the Suggested Donation podcast episode, and I was surprised and pleased that there wasn't all that much overlap between my interviews and the Suggested Donation one. On the Suggested Donation podcast, Brian goes into technical specifics in the production of his work, and he talks about artists like Michelangelo and Bernini and and more. And even though I'm not a painter, I do enjoy every episode of the Suggested Donation, and I learn a lot each episode, and I think you would too. And by the way, if you were in the New York area, Brian Booth Craig's latest solo exhibition called Internal Variations, Figures and Gestures, it opened April 7th, 2016, in New York at the Bernaducci Meisel Gallery, and will run for the rest of April. Brian Booth Craig is exclusively represented by Louis K. Meisel. The first segment of today's interview occurred as Brian Booth Craig and I were discussing his early arts education at Penn State University in an arts program geared towards postmodernism and conceptualism and lacking a representational component. What you didn't hear last week was when Brian and I digressed into a conversation about our experiences in pursuing figurative sculpture educations in the 1990s and perceptions of figurative art within the contemporary arts scene, what it means to be contemporary, the nature of arts education, and more. So, here it is. We pick up the conversation at the point when Brian speaks about the pushback some students receive from art schools when they show an interest in more traditional figurative work. I hear this a lot from people my generation, and even after, who say who have these horror stories, talk about how terrible their experience was sure, in sure. art school. And yeah, I know a dozen people. people. Just put them down. And I didn't have that at all. That's great. I didn't. Yeah. I, now, having said that, I had no, there was no one that could really teach me the things <laughs> that I was interested in. Right, right, right. But at least they weren't working against your interests. No, nobody worked against me. Yeah. Nobody, right. nobody, nobody berated me for, for pursuing it. That's now, interesting because I think a lot of people's experiences, like you said, are very, very different. They meet with a lot of, uh, a lot of pushback. Yeah, to, I, no, I, I see what you're saying. I, 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 I hear that often. And, you know, I became, I became kind of influenced by that as well because mm-hmm. I started to believe that derriere guard attitude, like, you know, the, that we're somehow, we're somehow uh, separate from the rest of the art world. But I, right. I, don't, right. I don't believe that. I think that there's, there's, the art world is a big place. We, say, we, use this, we use this term art world, and oftentimes people, their, 
what what they're thinking of is it is just a section of the art world right well obviously if you're only going to section the art world into that one piece then everything outside of that seems somehow uh closed off but i don't believe that's true and i don't think the 20 the 20th century is simply is simply a a rejection of one particular exploration in favor of another it's actually an arc I and mean, this is this mm -hmm. is that's where we are and we're actually in some ways we're very very fortunate to live in to, to have grown up in the postmodern age where things are much more eclectic some of that i think some of those I, those attitudes and thoughts about the art world and also the experience of representation are actually holdovers from 60s the 60s and the 70s yeah you know but but by the time the 80 by the time uh the eighties came along and I mean, you had people like Basquiat and um, Keith Haring making work that was clearly co-opting co a variety of, of cultural forms of expression, then, you know, everything started to change. So, by the, so in the, I don't believe that, that we, that there's this, there's this clear division in history and we're just sort of moving in opposite directions. It's a much more diverse and flexible history. That that it's a little bit, that division between between those two things is a bit of an intellectual red herring. I agree. I agree. I think people use the word art world uh, to denote the art market more than anything that's else. That's a good point. Yeah. I think it's a very good point. I don't. You and I were talking about this very recently. Just the the the, the difference between the function of the art world in the economy and the the cultural expression which is which is more about the the intellectual exploration in some ways that you could be talking about the academy academia mm -hmm. versus the economy which are two which are not necessarily the same and they they do influence each other but um but the econ you know the the, the economy of the art world you're right that is one thing because that that has certainly changed there are some perverse effects to that change however the the space that we live in for making representational art is a pretty big one right and i don't i don't i just don't think that the attitude of us versus them is a very helpful one that doesn't mean we have to accept everything that people make but there is all there there have always been levels of quality and varieties of creativity in, in human history sure and we live in an interesting age whereby you can you can actually explore quite a lot yeah. yeah and and you know to get back to what we were saying about education i think that the um the institutions that that we have now for for educating uh artists are completely different than the institutions that existed 100 years ago 150 mm -hmm. years ago uh we live in, we live in a very different age it's especially in the United, United States, whereas there's this egalitarian system of equal, supposedly equal access to education. And we get off on a political end of this, but there, but that, that sort of acceptance of the diversity within the, within the institutions of education, by virtue of that, you're going to have you're going to have a lot of changes, and um, I tend I tend to look at it less as um, you know, me having some sort of prophetic vision for, you know, speaking against a culture and saying, I'm part of this culture. So how, how, how do I want to use the, the knowledge and explorations of the last hundred years and recent times as well to inform what I'm doing? See, I think that what makes your work contemporary is if it's in dialogue with, your, with other contemporary explorations. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's not... What makes something contemporary is not a form; it's the it's the ideas that you're exploring through whatever form it may be. And I think if artists that want to use representation will just it can just let go of whatever resentments they may have from their own experience, um, and which which I would not invalidate. I'm sure there are plenty of people who did have the opposite experience that I had. But if they if people can let go of that and and just say what is the what what age do I live in, and how can I speak about the issues of being a contemporary human being through this medium of representation, whatever it may be—painting, sculpture, uh, photography, film, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
uh, if if we can if I can use that as a way to explore these these ideas, then I think the art will the art will be will be contemporary. Well, how do you it, how do you draw on uh, the contemporary? Uh, ideas, concepts, forms mm -hmm. in your own work because your That's work is is your, your work is mostly, if not entirely, single figure, uh, yeah. nude with very minimal props. I don't think I've ever seen any sort of clothing or drapery in your work. Correct. So how do you how do you include that's, that if it's if it's not really, about form? Well, that's a really good question because um, because my favorite I, I, the, a lot of my favorite artists are people that you wouldn't necessarily expect, and this partly goes back to my education um, and being introduced to certain artists. Uh, so that I draw upon some of those influences, but in not in ways that people would necessarily see. So for example. Uh, a few of my favorite artists that I that I still greatly admire. I mentioned Anthony Gormley, so he was a huge influence on me uh, when I was younger. Um, I mentioned Robert Graham, who I think you could probably see the, a lot of his influence coming coming through in my especially recent work. But but just the single figure nude, um, he was an enormous influence. Although less less uh, in terms of the ideas that he's exploring and more. Um, about some of the formal, I shouldn't say, see, ideas is a tricky word, but less to do with the, the conceptual nature of it and more to do with the formal ideas. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, but then, uh, I mean, I, my favorite living artist is Anish Kapoor. I think he's, really? I think he's brilliant. No I think he's absolutely brilliant. And I don't see, I, I don't see, um, uh, anyone who's doing doing who's who's grown as much as he has because i when i was in school he was just beginning to get noticed um or had maybe had been on the scene uh, for a few years but um so i it's interesting to have been a student and then watch somebody you admire mm -hmm. over 20 25 years change and grow and his growth is phenomenal i think in terms of his his uh the complexity of his work, um, and and the way in which his work has an has an has an imminence to it that I find very an intern internality to it that I find very compelling. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, although like as you said, formally, I don't I don't my work has nothing to do with what they are doing. They were big influences because as I started to study the figure uh the examples that i was going to look at other than robert graham were all 19th century or prior correct so i so i, I in some ways it was it was good grounding for me to be thinking about these more contemporary ideas um while i was trying to learn things from the past right uh, and and I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. I don't think they're contradictory at all. No, like we were saying before, it is a continuation. It's not, yeah. you know, this is what it is now, and that's what it was before. Absolutely, and and um, I think that the 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 artists that I've that I think about today, who I believe are using representation. I'm talking about sculptors now, using representation in an interesting manner. I can see a lot of that. Whether they whether they are looking at the same artists as I am, mm -hmm. I can see a lot of that uh, exploration in their own work. But there's no, another aspect to influences that I think is very important for contemporary representational artists to think about, particularly the those of us who who uh, are, we're trying to learn from the techniques of the past, uh, which is a perfectly valid thing to do. However, the idea that somehow we can just pull along all the luggage that came from the past and and open it up now right and right. say here's this look at look at all of this look at look at the look at the suitcase this is a great suitcase and open up and say look at these ideas inside it's 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 denying the your own it's not only denying the 20th century it's denying your own experience because i don't know anyone who who's who's living today and making that kind of art who is also ignoring the music that's being made, the films that are being made, television, contemporary, other contemporary forms of, of cultural expression. There may be things about the contemporary art world that are that are disturbing to us, but 
those things are disturbing to a lot of people, not just right. figurative artists. Right. And um, I think what I think is great about the age in which we live in is we have some art forms that exist today that didn't exist 200 years ago, like film, for mm -hmm. example, or recorded music. So to 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 do that, to open up that suitcase and say this is what we should be doing, you're picking and choosing what you really want to what what you really want to look at. Sure, you know, sure. These people aren't they would they're not saying let's get rid of movies and recorded music and all of these things. Um, so so why not why not take take from everything that you can, and um, I'm not I'm not saying in, that I'm particularly influenced by 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 those other art forms, but a lot of the artists that I see doing interesting contem contemporaries doing interesting representational work, you can see the influence of these other art forms. Sure. So, for example, Vincent Desiderio, mm -hmm. you can see the influence of film. Yeah, and and well, I think and, it's a lot easier to see these sorts of influences in painters. This is true. Yeah. This yeah. is true. It's it's a, it is a little easier to see. In we, we don't have modern true. figurative sculpture that isn't tied to the past. This is because true. we can't, you know, you you, were, you mentioned, um, you know, everyone, you know, going, you know, looking to the past to learn how to do the figure. Well, where else are we going to learn to do it? This is true. You know? This is true. This is, yeah. And this is, and I think there, you know, this is part of the evolution of where we are. Um, but I, because I do, I, as you, if you look at, if you look at what's being made today in, in contemporary figurative sculpture, you can see an evolution. If you go back 20 years, you can really see an evolution to this point. Mm -hmm. And, I think things are really becoming interesting. Yeah, me too. Me too. I think it's, I mean, it's so different from when we both started pretty much at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's so different now. It's a different, it is a different world for figurative sculptors. Yeah, it's a different world and in, in that people are, people are now, have gathered enough of the skill in the past and then started to adapt it. Right. To, to contemporary practice. Right. I think, I think sculptors are probably a decade or two behind the painters in this, actually. That's I think, true. I, I think sculptors got, a little bit of a, a late start simply because we didn't, you know, sculpture doesn't have an R.H. Ives Gamel, you know, so, sort of a steward of the past who was That's able true. to sort of not resurrect technique, um, but continue it. But I, I think figurative sculptors today had to fairly pretty much resurrect the techniques or yeah. invent new ways. Yeah, the tech exactly. The techniques that we're using, certainly. Um, although, again, and this is this is the part of the story that I think is is. There, there, there are anomalies within that story because um, Robert Graham is a good example, who's work, you know, who, who started doing representation, who started doing figurative sculpture in the '60s. Um, now, of course, it took him a little while to to get recognition, but he, of course, was very successful, and he didn't have anyone teaching him. He, he, he figured it. Out, he figured out a methodology that worked for for what he was interested in, and was very very successful at doing that, and. Um, so there, 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 and maybe he had met somebody in, in Los Angeles in the '60s who taught him something, but but there are breadcrumbs all along the way, and that's just it's just now that we're able to see the results of that gathering of experience and yeah. knowledge, yeah. Um, and and you know may, again going back back to what we said about the 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 20th century and the changes of the 20th century, maybe some of maybe some of the the things that were lost, losing some of those things is good is good. Because reinventing ways of doing things, you know, in some ways that might be might have created a better situation. Sure, sure. So that so that because I see people doing amazingly creative things that um, that ha that are obviously adaptations of contemporary materials and tools. And, sure, I think of ZBrush. You know, yeah, what right. what that's done to sculpture. And actually, I take it back. I mentioned that you know there is no you know sort of film equivalent. Uh, for sculpture as there is for painting, you know, in terms of right. modern sensibility. Of course there is. Movie monsters and, and you know, sort of these 3D animation, you know, and it doesn't all have to be Lord of the Rings sort of fantasy sci-fi. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on, people producing really beautiful work yeah. digitally. This is true. That's yeah. actually, that's a that's a really, really good point because think about the, the people who were doing special effects in film. Mm -hmm. So there were people doing it um, it just it just hadn't found a place within the world of exhibiting objects. Right, right, That's right. The idea, but but there are a lot of people who started out in the film industry, special effects, prop making, who then went into this true uh, fine art. This true, and all of those skills that they carry with them 
are going to be utilized in unique and interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And this is this is this is again why I don't like the separation of past and present because uh, or separation of old techniques and new techniques mm -hmm. because tools are just tools. They they have nothing to do with whether or not the artistic creations are good or bad. I think I I have a lot of faith in human creativity and whether it's ZBrush or some modern materials, uh, people are going to find interesting, creative ways of utilizing it. So I don't, I have, I, there's the, uh, we're getting it, we could get into this a little bit more, but the debate about technology and these things like ZBrush. And I don't see what the debate is. It's there. People are going to use it. And some people are going to use it better than others. Yeah, it's like the debate exactly. of photography and painting, I suppose. Precisely, yeah. Yeah. precisely. I, I, I don't think that the, the the question is whether or not it's going to kill sculpture or whatever. I mean, right. It's, it's baloney. It's, this has to do with whether whether or not people will find interesting ways of using that technology that will connect to the to to the to the interests of the viewer and grab their attention. That's it. Yeah, you know, here in Florence, um, there are, there's a, a strong segment of the student population um, that either come from the uh, sort of 3D animation illustration world and then get into fine art or go the other way. They, you know, start at Florence Academy and then decide mm -hmm. to pursue, mm -hmm. you know, 3D and digital digital work. Now, you are the chair of the sculpture department at uh, Old Lyme College, is it now? Well, it's now what is it? uh, Lyme Academy College of Fine Arts at the University of New Haven. As as department chair there, do you see people moving from you know sort of the real real world into uh, into the digital, digital world? Yeah, um, or vice versa, people coming from the digital world who want not, to do it in class. Not as it's not not as much uh, within the education there. Although that's going to change, we're going to start adding components of uh, really. Yeah, we're going to start adding. It'll it well, it's it's a it's a segment of of um of the program that will intersect with other programs mm -hmm. so so if people are doing animation or illustration you know the, these are these are things that that lots of people are going to be interested in in utilizing so sculptors are going to want to employ those te technologies as well wow. um, you're going to get but, a 3d scanner and a printer yeah, and that sort well of thing. we already have the printer awesome. we have, yeah we're going to have all of that stuff eventually in fact, there are students. There are students who are studying, quote, traditional methods, to use those skills as they go into into digital right, work. Right. Right. Like um, uh, going to a classical conservatory for piano and then coming out and being a rock and roll musician. Right. It's kind Precisely. of the same sort of thing. Precisely. You learn, you learn the scales. You learn the fundamentals. And in fact, I think those are the people who are going to do the most interesting things with with those technologies mm -hmm. because they will they will un, they will have they will have they will have both sides of those of 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 that spectrum in their brain as they're working. Mm -hmm. So if they're starting, if they're starting work digitally, they will understand the consequences physically. They start something physically and they go into digital. They'll understand the consequences in the end for the for where they begin. So I I think that those that people are going to be most equipped. Yeah, but I don't. But again, it has it's not the tool's fault if people do bad things with it. You know, as a carver, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's not the chisel's fault if right, your sculpture right. doesn't look right. Poor craftsman blames his tools. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I don't, uh, I'm not against any of those technologies, any of the advancements. Uh, I'm a big believer in, in, and have a lot of faith in human creativity and the ability of, pe of for people to, to adapt and explore. And part of that faith comes from my knowledge of the past. You know, we, we, People, people have this idea as if you know that the gods came down and gave us these gifts of here's how you will sculpt. You know, um, people invented these things <laughs> that we see. You know, when I, when I go to a place like Rome or come to a place like Florence, and I see what people were able to do, just by sheer, just because they they felt like they had to, just sheer ingenuity. I think, well, yeah. I mean, what what's changed? We can still do that today, right? And I'm sure you know some Roman. Was back there saying, "What is this new technology? You know, this is going to ruin our traditions." You know, yeah. And then, you know, those voices are silenced and they go away. In this next segment, Brian Booth Craig and I discussed his year studying at the New York Academy of Art in the early 1990s, and his perspective on the attitudes driving figurative arts education at the time, 
and how those attitudes have changed since then. I found I was very discouraged by that experience and mm. and felt that I didn't I, I wasn't I, I really was having a hard time connecting the two interests that I had, which mm -hmm. was contemporary art and contemporary intellectual thought and techniques that I wanted to, to employ to try to interdigitate those two, two interests of mine. And, you know, it, it, again, it was the, the, there was this sense that, that somehow we had to revive a particular period and yeah. and what seemed ridiculous to me was they were arguing over which period we should be reviving that right well sense I mean, to me well i mean in in the in the scope of the last 600 years there are lots of different things you could revive and sure, sure and sure. you know like you said you do have to pick away you can't you know kind of do everything right. and i think i think that was a near universal impulse in the 90s you know, I started at Charles Cecil in 96, and it was, you know, very much that same way. And everyone had their own piece of of art history that right. they were the safeguards of. There was an incredible rivalry that doesn't really exist now, um, but between Charles Cecil Studio and Florence Academy of Art. And back in the early 90s, they were both about the same size. Mm -hmm. Charles has stayed the same size purposefully. Mm -hmm. you know, likes, he likes, uh, you know, it's Charles Cecil Studio. It's not an academy. Right. But then Florence right. Academy became, you know... It's right. it's huge. It's enormous. It's got several. Right. You know, it's gonna take over the world someday. We think, yeah. but uh, but uh, Charles was 17th century, yeah, and right. Dan was 19th century, and you know they were sort of stewards of of yeah, these you know. traditions. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting. You know, it, um, that's a really interesting point that you make. That it was it was it was it was um, something that was across the board in that particular time. Because I I I think that's also true. Not just for the representation, the people who were doing representational work back then, but in academia, in the art world as well, there was much more. There was much more segmentation. Mm -hmm. One of the exciting things about now is people just mix. Everything's getting mixed up, and much more people are drawing from more sources. A, a good example is illustration. Say, you know, uh, some people still have this attitude that illustration and fine art are separate, right? And Back then, you know, those two things never mixed. But now you see people, people drawing from all sources to create interesting things. And there's no so the high and low separation is is, is dissolving a little bit. Mm -hmm. The the segmentation of genres is dissolving a little bit, and that's probably happening in hopefully in the representational wor world of art that that's dissolving. Although there are people, I won't like mention names, but there are there are people who would like to preserve some of that. Sure, and, and but and there's room have... for those guys too. Oh sure, they you can... know. I mean, it's just right. the fact that all these schools have been churning out students for so long. Sure. Of course, they're going to sort of disseminate and go in all sorts of different directions. Certainly, and it's certainly. fine if you want to be a steward of you know of you know the classical world or right. of uh, 19th century right. uh, romanticism. Right. Yeah, the Gestapo is not going to come and stop them. Right. There's no. There's no one. There's no one preventing them from doing. Um, you know, whenever I I hear people say that there's no there's nobody's making a place for us to do this. Like, you you live in the most prosperous time in human history, where. <laughs> Who's stopping you? Yeah, Nobody's yeah. stopping you. It's not. I think what it is is. Uh, we talked about this recently. I believe. I think some of it is sour grapes. Yeah, and also believe, because they can't find a market, they're saying, right. "Where's the place for me?" Right. And what they mean is, "Why can't I sell?" Right. You right. Know? Why? And, why? What? Where are the galleries? You know, knocking down my door. Right. You know. Right. Right. And that's a little bit of. I, for example, I could talk about somebody like. Somebody who's very financially successful, like Jeff Koons, and people, people get very get very worked up about Jeff Koons, you know. And but part of me gets suspicious when people talk that way because part of me thinks, well, what you don't like is that he's making more money than you are. You know? Well, and, I, I'm and sure that's half of it. That's half of it. Yeah. I'm sure that's yeah. half of it. But also, there's there, you know, I there, think there's a there's a um, a sense, uh, and it's not unjustified that he is a bit of a charlatan. Sure, I'm sure people can people yeah people have that. But if he if he is, it doesn't hurt me. Right, exactly it, right. It, it, exactly, it, it has nothing to do with me. Yeah, yeah. It's, you don't need to you need you don't need to crusade against him. No, there's no, no need to. There's no need to crusade against. Um, you know, we're not we're not living in an age where 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 you can lose your head over these things. You know, in, at least in the United States. I mean, there are places where you can lose your head. Or, you know, there, <laughs> right. there, there are people who have that. That's a real problem for yeah, them. Yeah, sure. And um, and the, the kind of work that they want to create really is, really is politically or or 
or societally um, discouraged. Uh, but in in the Western world, to have that sort of complaint comes across as a little as a little bit whiny to me. Yeah, it's a bit of a first world problem. Yeah, it's a first world. It's you know white white people problems. <laughs> you know, yeah, and yeah. and I don't think that's I I think that's um, not a valid way of of critiquing the thing that you're the thing that we are that that we are doing right right i think i think we need to be more a little bit more open-minded about that we'll hear more from brian booth craig when the sculptor's funeral continues all right it's time to give a shout to one of the sponsors of the podcast that's right friends Blick Art Supplies, the largest and oldest provider of art supplies in the United States, who ship their quality wares around the world. Their superior customer service, extensive selection, and competitive prices make them the choice for professional and amateur artists, art educators, architects, designers, students, and hobbyists. Virtually anyone requiring quality art materials for work or pleasure. And seriously, there isn't another art supplier on the web with as many supplies and materials specifically for sculptors than Blick. It's really huge. Over 70,000 products for artists of all types. You can get everything you need from dozens of different clays and plasters to fine Italian marble carving tools, clay modeling tools, specialty casting mediums, waxes, body casting supplies, turntables, armatures, books on sculpture. Basically, if you need it for sculpture, they have it. And shipping is free in the U.S. on most items if your order is for more than $100. But Blick is not merely a place to buy stuff. They have product information specialists trained to hunt down answers to your tough questions regarding materials, techniques, and safety. Hundreds of how-to videos are also available on DickBlick.com or on their YouTube channel, including video lesson plans for teachers and product demonstrations. So that's Blick Art Supplies, but let me tell you how the sculptor's funeral fits in here. You see, by buying your art supplies from Blick, you can contribute directly to the support of the Sculptor's Funeral podcast. All you need to do is this. Go to the podcast website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, and click on any of the banner links that you will see there for Blick. That link will take you right to the Blick website where you can buy what you need. It's that simple. Just remember that you need to click through a link at thesculptorsfuneral.com first so that Blick knows I sent you. Because then what happens is Blick will give the Sculptor's Funeral a small percentage of your total bill. It's like you sort of get a discount and then you donate that discount in support of the show. You're paying what you would pay normally, but by using the link on thesculptorsfuneral.com, a little something trickles down to the podcast. So the next time you stock up on armature wire or mold rubber, modeling tools, and plastilina, do it in a way that supports the only podcast out there devoted to the global community of figurative sculptors. Go to thesculptorsfuneral.com and click on Blick. And support the show. And thank you. Getting back to the subject of Brian Booth Craig's work, We touched upon his earlier work in which Brian produced several full-length nude self-portraits and the reasons he chose such a personal theme, which could have left him uncomfortably vulnerable. This led us to the topic of the nature of the use of nude models itself, its inherent power structure, the assumptions artists make in the use of models, and how our assumptions can sometimes be at odds with our intentions with the nude figure. I'm not interested in the the act of making con- figurative work for its purely mimetic qualities. Um, the perceptual experience and, and a record of perception, pure just visual perception, is not really what my work is about. Um, even though it, it, it's made through perception, it's not, about, it's not about a mimetic representation of that experience. I think that's actually a very, very difficult thing to do and do well. I, not that I think it's an invalid uh, approach or invalid um, form of art making, but I just, I, I, it's not my interest and I think it's a very difficult thing, one to do. So, so that, particular, that particular aspect of art making where it's about perceptual synthesis is not really what I'm doing. I'm actually more interested in the myth of it. That actually that what we're doing in most of life is creating a narrative that's 
part false, part true. Mm -hmm. well, and, it's, well, it's or just it's just true, but not necessarily real. Complete or complete, right? That we're but but it's also a part falsification. Sure, we, sure. Well, that, you know, truth doesn't have to be real. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And I and that's why the self portraits to me, they're not actually literal self portraits. They're they're partly partly fabricated mm -hmm. and somewhat unreliable in their physical qualities. And I and I rely upon the the juxtapositions to to give the in, the viewer an indication that you're in another world. You're not in the same world of my experience. I'm I'm fabricating a myth that will outlive me. You know that will be me. Mm -hmm. That will be that will be me. It's a it's the sort of the um when Michelangelo was criticized for the um, the Medici portraits, you know, uh -huh. uh, and people say, well, it doesn't look like them. Yes, yeah. in a thousand years, he's going to care. Is. Yeah. Well, he said, yeah, it will. Oh, it will. Said, oh is said, that what he said? He said, well, they, he said, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess it was a thousand years or a hundred years. He said, they, they will, but, or that they, it won't matter. But he said, but the other thing he said was, they will, they will look like them. Right. Right. So eventually, the things that we make become our proxies. But I'm not an idealist. Like I don't like. In other words, I'm not like. Um, I'm not saying that these are Neoplatonic representations of myself. Mm -hmm. They're actually much more fraught with misgivings about myself. Um, maybe that's where the like, references, the violent and more morbid references, come in. That I don't. That I don't have that kind of idealism in me. But. They're crystallizations of the self, is maybe the best way to put it, using Stendhal's expression. I don't believe that... Because the problem with... I, here's, here's, my, here's my issue with the ideal. You can't idealize an individual, but you can idealize a category. In other words, the ideal eliminates the specificities of the individual. Right, right. right. And, that's, and that's its job. Right, exa precisely. It, it retains the character of the category without referencing this particular individual. That's the notion of the ideal artistically. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that the ideal doesn't have a place in art. Just for myself, I'm interested in, uh, I'm interested in the particular qualities of individuals. And, and so I want to retain that character right. of that particular individual. That's why I said I use the word crystallization for my self-portraits, that they are a crystallization of the essential characters of the self. Uh, meaning that that everything create has a has a more um, more refined quality, without re without eliminating those particular qualities. And that's a very that's a very abstract thing to say, but that was important for me. I didn't want mm -hmm. to I didn't want to make myself into something that I'm not, and yet at the same time, I wanted to make a version of myself in, through a self portrait that is slightly unreliable. Uh, because it's a sculptural idea. It's not. It's not a. I'm not a geneticist. I'm not trying to clone myself. I'm trying to create a a, a, a new life and not a, not a reproduction of the old one through the act of making. And you don't. Although a lot of your work have has been self portraits in the past. Do you actually refer to them as self portraits? Are they titled as self portraits? Yes. yes. Oh, they are. They, okay. Yeah, they are. They are. I mean, it's, it's very important to me that they are referred to as self portraits because I think it's it's the key that unlocks the meaning, and. Without that, they could be very easily understood as something else, um, hmm. as narrative elements or references to to other allegories, as you said. But um, I don't see myself continuing that particular line of inquiry. My life has changed in, in the same way that you know, I change occupations when I get to a point where I feel like I've, I've done it long enough. I think that specific line of inquiry artistically has has at this point i don't see how it continue, can continue it has reached its end point uh i'm very fascinated with this 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 idea of the female figure and um the male as an i the male nude as an idea outside of the self-portrait doesn't really have not that it doesn't have an interest to me but i i haven't found a way to enter into that yet um, whereas the female, it's the female. There's all I have all kinds of thoughts about how I relate to the feminine, and what female presence can mean to me. That I that that seems like the place that I'm being led right now, mm -hmm. uh, and I and I use that word carefully, led, because I don't 
I prefer to feel like I'm being led rather than doing the leading. Uh, and, and again, that might, maybe that line of inquiry will end in five or 10 years. I don't know. So the females are, are, are utterly fascinating to me to work on. They're just like, they're just so, they're so full of possibilities for thought and that I don't see myself changing anytime soon. Uh, unless I, you know, again, unless I, I, maybe if I get, maybe this is the key, maybe I need to get a male model in the studio and see what, and just see, see what, what arises. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. I don't think I know of a male figure you've done that isn't you. Not, not in the current work. I mean, only, only studies that I did as a student. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that you're right. You're absolutely huh. right. There, Maybe it is just a matter of getting one in and see what comes out. Yeah, that could be the that could be the case. Uh, however, I do I do think that there's a lot more that I could that I can say or that I want to learn about in using a female model. The sense of the other and the the trying to trying to relate myself as a contemporary male to um, to the female model. Is a, is a real challenge. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's the challenge of it. It seems more of a challenge to me. I don't mean in terms of technique. I just I just mean in terms of walking that 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 very difficult line. I one thing I want to avoid. And I mentioned this before. I really want to avoid the idea that somehow um, women are there just as objects for our just just for our taking. You know that that. I want there to be a certain amount of self-control and self-possession within the within the object. And this is one of the things I like always liked about Robert Graham's work. You know, oh, they're very simple. They're very simple in a lot of ways, and and they're very beautiful. But but they seem they seem so simply presented that it's it's as if the model said, "This is I'm I'm a woman. I'm here. I'm standing here," and she's not. She's not in any kind of classicizing pose, or what would I say? The um, languid pose mm -hmm. that says "I'm available." Right, right. Yeah, you, you. I think you know what I'm referring to. I know exactly. With, yeah, with a yeah, lot yeah. Of, An imminently available person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, defenses. No, and no character to, to have to. You know, no intellect to have to deal with. It's right. just a female body. Yeah, I agree with you. I, that's exactly what it is. A lack of character. A lack of sentient, uh, a lack of personality, almost. They don't represent anything but the ideal that that the artist wants to create. I do think if you're if you're a male artist who cares about feminist concerns, you can't blindly go into it acting as if it's not. There's not something going on in your interaction with that with the female model and your representation of them. I think to do so is is neither responsible. Or honest, and in addition to to ignore the fact that that when you're using the nude, whether it's a male nude or a female nude, that there is some element of the sexual in there, whether it's explicit or or implicit, or just the nature of being human, is also ignoring the reality, right? That when people say, "Well, I like the nude because it's beautiful," not because there's any, I, there's nothing sexual about it. Like, I don't know what planet you're living on. But that's not the reality. The reality is if you're going to, if you, especially if you're male and you're going to depict a female nude, you need to be aware of how that, historically, how the female nude has been represented, mm -hmm. how it's been used, um, both ideologically and also um, as a representation of male, male, quote, superiority and dominance. And I think that's something that we need to be conscious of as, as artists. Having said all of that, I am I am not a believer in people editing and censoring themselves. Not at all. I think as soon as you become afraid of doing something, you should you, alarm bells should go off, because you, your job as an artist is not to run scared from everybody. Your sure. job and your job is to to present to the world something that will make them think about. Their experience yeah and sexuality can be a part of that i mean just because sure. uh, a, a female nude a, a male sculpting a female nude you know an implied sexual uh content to that sure. work that doesn't necessarily make it negative 
Exactly. It can be celebratory as well. Precisely. It can be a sexy sculpture. Not necessarily sexy. That's such a loaded, horrible term. No, I know what you're saying, uh, though, because... uh, Right. It yeah. can have it can have it can speak about sexuality. Right. Right. And I think that's the key thing is that that, that avoiding a, a, and I'm and I'm sensitive to this being from the United States where people have such a such a conflicted notion of sexuality where where on the one hand you see extreme extreme perversions of the the ability of males to 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 take whatever they want and yet this puritanical reaction to anything that that speaks of it um and so i i am very aware of that because i think that that that's a that's not a that's neither one of those extremes is healthy that there's somewhere in between where where we can talk about these primal urges and primal energies that we have and use art as a way to both talk about them and explore them but reflect upon them and hopefully hopefully also advance people to thinking in a more more humane way about all of this but but anything that anything that avoids death or sex or our feeling of displacement in the world the things that are things that are difficult you know any avoidance of that because they're difficult to me seems like a seems like a uh, an abdication of your responsibility that doesn't mean you have to talk about those things but if you're avoiding it because you think it's uncomfortable then, then that's probably something to explore rather than to walk away from. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, and, and, and that to me was the challenge with the, using the female nude again was how do I do this in a way that doesn't, doesn't abuse the responsibility and doesn't also, but doesn't also avoid the, the complexity of the issue. Do you think it's a, a bias, this, this idea of um, sort of woman as sexual object or even even men as sexual objects in figurative art, do you think it's it's naturally biased that way simply by virtue of the way we train? Because how do you become a, a figurative sculptor? You you hire a male or a female doesn't matter. You get them to take their clothes off, and you try to copy them. And there is no content right. attached to it. As That's a student, right. I think you're absolutely right. You know, you're you're I just think, yep. You know, it's I, it it, I it is a meaningless news because it's a study because it's yeah, not a it's right. not about the content. It's about learning. Uh, yeah. the technique but then you do that for several years and you leave school and people like your student work and someone you know gallery would say you know i can sell these nudes you know yeah. okay so i'll hire another female model and i'll put her in a nice attractive languid pose yeah. and it becomes a self-perpetuating yep. cycle and it's completely innocent of i agree with of you. you know sort of like domination sure. uh, or subjugation of feminism sure it's just the way we train and if I we're not agree. cognizant of the difference between hiring a model to do a study and producing a work of art that involves a nude, yeah. it's going to perpetuate itself. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think this. I think that the 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 sense of it being a purely uh, intellectual process, devoid of any human emotion or experience of of having a physical body in your presence, is exactly the problem. That, that but, somehow that somehow the study. The study just it you just we just people do studies forever they just do study after study after study right but when I'm when I like when I'm in the studio with with or actually yeah, not just in a studio but in the physical presence of another person I I'm I'm very aware of their physical presence and I find it's a very it's a very charged uh, environment when you have a nude body in your studio who has a life. That they're bringing into the studio, and they're not just there as they're not just there as uh, as an, another object to study. At least in my experience. What, like but, I, well, that's my, because you didn't go to a figurative exactly, art school. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> because it is in yeah. everybody else's experience that right. they are just a body there. They are just an object there to study. Right. The right. point is not to right. to you know delve into the you know the depths of your soul or the soul of the of the subject it's rather to to learn how to do a contour correctly that's right. how to get proportion correctly um the fact that it is a, a nude female or a nude male um is is incidental right but at and the it, same time necessary because that's yeah, going to be the, right. the the meat and potatoes right. and then the people become interchangeable like they, they just become interchangeable elements it could be you could have one model one week, one model next week, and they're just they're just yeah. And as long just, as they sort of fit into your window right, of you right. know sort of uh, attractiveness or yeah or whatever or, or whatever you're going for 
Precisely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the the, and that that may have been useful. That may be useful for certain kinds of work. Right. There are people. I think there's a way in which you can use that that impersonal um, interaction with a model. So there is a way in which that could be used. But I don't think that most people who go through that process are thinking of it on that level of in, like intellectually as as you know that they that the, there's a there's a separation between the professional like the quote professional way of dealing with the model. You know. I and and when I started doing the self portraits, I became hyper aware of this. I thought. I can't treat myself impersonally. You know, <laughs> like, like I'm putting myself out there. I'm showing, I'm showing, I don't want to hide things. You know, I want to show the, the certain aspects of, of who I am. And if I treat myself impersonally, it would be, it would be a contradiction. It created for me this very, this very interesting environment whereby, you know, I, I'm doing something slightly uncomfortable. This is going to sound really strange, but if I'm in the studio and I needed to I have a mirror and I need to, I'm doing a self-portrait, I have to take off my clothes. Sure. No, right? I, I don't know of an artist who hasn't used themselves as a model at right. one point with a mirror. And there's a, that's and I find that like once you do that and you suddenly realize that the act of making an object that creates the illusion of personality, then to try to remove personality from the act of making it seems it seems like a contradiction to me. In other words, if I'm if I'm when I'm when I'm when I'm working with a model, I I never ever make it impersonal. I never I never just say you know stand there be quiet, you know at the end of the session pay and they leave you know I always I'm always interested in like who are they what do they do what what's like what what is it that drives them to do this what makes them want to come to the studio and take off their clothes, and put themselves in a vulnerable position. But yet a position that's also quite powerful because they can they have a lot of control over what 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 ends up being created. Sure, and they can um, bring it to a halt as well. They, exactly, by just they not can, coming back. Precisely. So there, there's a, there's an interesting, very very um, psychologically complex relationship between the person posing and the person working, which, as you said, in the in in the academic environment, it becomes becomes. It gets cut off. It becomes well, impersonal. because it, because it's it not one to. and one. You're exactly. in a classroom situation exactly. where you you, you can't have fourteen students all developing a personal relationship with the model at the same time. Precisely. It's just not going to happen. Precisely. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I think it's an innocent but but unintended and unintended consequence of that environment yeah. and an unfortunate one. I'm always encouraging my students when they want to start doing their own sculpture. I always encourage them to hire their own model. I say, you know, don't don't hire a model. You can hire one of the school models if you want, but hire the, hire your own model because you're gonna the, you will suddenly realize how different it is being in a room by yourself with a model, and you have to figure out how to how to make something using the generous giving of information that there that's occurring right there with from that person because that's what's happening. There they you know, obviously you're paying them, but that's not an easy position to be in. And it can be uncomfortable at first. So I believe that that's a, an, a, an extremely important element for what I do. And in fact, I've often, I've had these experiences in exhibitions of my work, my self-portraits, where I will be, you know, have the, the, the piece on a pedestal in the gallery, and there's an opening and people are standing there, and I'll be standing next to, next to the piece talking to somebody, and they'll stop and say, I'm really uncomfortable. Like this makes me really uncomfortable because I'm talking to you and I see a nude representation of you next to me. Mm-hmm. And and I say, well, that's that's good. That's good. I mean, the fact that it makes you uncomfortable is suddenly putting you into a place where you have to think about what's happening in that experience. If you had no discomfort whatsoever and you say, oh, that's a nice, beautiful object, and you walked away, then I would think that I failed on some level. Now, now my job isn't. I'm not trying to say that my job is to is to provoke or to or, or to make people run away because they're uncomfortable but i think there's a little like a little twinge of that personality coming through the object yeah it's just a little bit of a flick on the nose to sort of have, you know make a person blink a couple times and realize what they're looking at right right yeah. right right exactly i want people to think think about what it is they're actually viewing mm-hmm. because it, you know as 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 sculptors who are doing this we, you remember when you were first learning 
for you, it was just all you wanted to learn was how do you make the turn of the form? How do you like? How do you create that silhouette? How do you organize these these proportions and these these this all of this information? You get you get sucked into seeing the surfaces. Sure. All of, how do you do and, an eye? A yeah. Mouth, how do you do like an ear? ear? Yeah. Right. And and there's something very there's something very aesthetically pleasing about that experience of just seeing the way things move in space, um, and that's very seductive and. That's not the end, because you can't assume that everyone who looks at artwork is going to be having that same experience. Some people will. Some people will be pure connoisseurs, and they will just want to look at the way things are made and the beauty of the line. But other people, most people are going to want um, want to have an experience. But I do think that, so that, that, um, that element of the, the illusion of personality, the, the psychological presence of the object, as a proxy for the experience of the model with with the with the artist in the studio and the the narrative space of the object in the viewer's life that to me that's that's what i'm going for that's what i'm fascinated by and i do agree with you that, that it's a difficult thing for students who study this intensively over several years in the studio environment where there are all kinds of rules Mm-hmm. and proprieties, which there yeah, must there, be. Well, there the, must and, be. In the States, it's particularly bad for that in terms of people not being allowed to talk to the model while she's, yeah. or he is posing. Yeah, that sort of thing. You don't, you know, you don't have a personal relationship. It's forbidden yeah. to have any sort of... Yeah, there are all know, kinds of social rules within the environment. Yeah, that yeah, that to, to protect, you know, the, the model. And, and yeah, when you, when, you, when you look at it as, you know, sort of protection in the workplace, yeah, obviously it's an incredibly vulnerable sure. um, position Absolutely. to be in. Sure. Um, and so, you know, there's there's sense there's sense behind it. Sure. And it's also not it's not the real world. And it's not the real world. It's not the real world. Exactly. The real world is a much more um, complicated and 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 you're working with the models one on one. You're not gonna you're not going to not <laughs> talk to the model after hiring her. You know, it's no. But I do know of art. I do know of artists who who um, who think of the model more as just a so, as source material. Sure, sure. Right? I, I think physical, that's... Physical, I, visual source material. I think that's fairly common. I, I think agree. that that's I probably agree. more common than not. And, and, and again, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad approach, but that if you're going to do that, you need to be, know that that's your approach. Mm-hmm. And that there's... You have to be cognizant of yeah, it. You have to be very really cognizant good. of it, that, 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 they're, they're, that if you're... Tr- Mark Trujillo, painter, uh, Mark Trujillo and I were talking just a few weeks ago in Rome and we're talking about um, how you know how people make their work and how they reflect upon it and one of the things we discussed was the um, the way in which uh, you always need to be asking yourself what are your intentions and what are your assumptions and sometimes those two things are in contradiction and and reflecting upon your process and what you're doing and how you intend to 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 speak through that process needs to line up with what your assumptions are. And sometimes those two things are in contradiction. So, so I think it's a good thing to ask yourself as an artist, you know, what am I, what do, what do I intend to, to, to do through this act of making? And what am I assuming about the process? And I think that's what we're, ta- that's exactly what we're talking about here is that sometimes people make the assumption that you can, that you can make something very personal in an impersonal way. Finally, Brian Booth Craig talks about what might be in store in the future for the education of students in representational sculpture. He offers his insight for those wishing to pursue the craft, and he discusses what he thinks makes for a good teacher of sculpture. I mean, it's, you know, these schools, who knows what will happen? I mean, I, 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 um, you know, the, the, the things that, that are offered now I, we would have never predicted 25 years ago. Um, so who knows? I mean, maybe, I mean, it could, it could end up that more and more schools have representational courses in their curriculums and, and it'll change everything. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think... my, my advice for students is, you know, just try to figure out what information you need to get, what people you want to study with. And find ways to go study yeah. with them. Yeah, don't don't and look just, for the schools. Look for the instructors. Exactly. Yeah. Because there's there's no magic bullet. No. It doesn't exist. No. It's up to the student to, to to take ownership of their education, and 
they're obviously if they want a degree they're going to have to stick with one school for a while, a while. and I, that's what i i tell my students i say you know you this is this will be a good grounding as a as a bfa education here at lyme and you can supplement that with other things there's nothing wrong with that you can you know you could go do a workshop with this person or that person supplement it uh but if you want the degree you need they people will eventually have to stick with one yeah educational institution but i'm a big advocate of people seeking out the instru instructors and if they want to learn you know if they want to learn stone carving study with you or just um it could just be doing like a one or two week workshop to see a person's technique and yeah, yeah okay that's interesting yeah. i'll employ that a little bit um i'm a i'm a big big advocate of that i never ever tell my students to sculpt like me my job is I have this theory of education, which is kind of basic, um, and it has to do with has to do with uh, raising children as well, which is basically just a more personal form of education. Right? <laughs> uh, your job as an educator is to help people understand the world and find their place in it. That's it, basically, and everything else should flow from that philosophy, because if they because everybody's place is going to be different, and they just need to understand how they fit, and. Uh, it's not my job to make them all copies of me. In fact, I, that would be that would be self defeating. Absolutely, way of would, approaching yeah. it. So I'm always I'm always an advocate. Like if they want to do, they they if they want to do study with somebody who does work very different from me, I never discourage you. I just say, well, you I mean, go do it. See what you can learn. I mean, maybe it'll be good for you. Maybe it won't. But it's an experience, and that's a that's a good thing. It's up to you. It's up to the student to reflect upon it, and and employ it to their own advantage and if i can be a mentor in that way and sort of helping them find their place in the world that's then i think i'm then i think that's good that's enough i'm satisfied with that uh but it's it's also it's also a difficult position to take because students often in in particularly in the united states people come to schools with a with a particular goal in mind and they'll say they'll say this is what i want to do and mm -hmm. then they already have a preconceived notion of what it means to be an artist and and i'm sort of subverting that a little bit by saying by saying well i can give you this this is what i know right this is what i can give you but i can't give you everything <laughs> and then they end up having to explore yeah a yeah bit. no every everyone's education is so vastly different yeah and as it should be as it should be yeah you know we we glorify the 19th century so much you know the Ecole de Beaux-Arts wouldn't it be great if it was still like that you just go and you know you got everything and then you come out and you have a career and you got the Prix de Rome um but uh you know I think I think it's so much more valuable being able to you know find your own way I mean it, the school produced a lot of really amazing artists sure and it produced sure. A, sure. an incredible amount of sure. bad artists and people who never became artists at all That's because true. it was a system that you could plug into and you didn't yeah. have to pursue That's a right. personal right. Uh, sort of uh, message or statement. And, uh, well, I think, yeah. Made, made for a lazier artist in a certain sense. And Intellectually. Certain, I agree with you. I do agree with you. I think that's true because all you had to do is follow the rules. Of, yeah. If you could check off each box, mm -hmm. say it's this, 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 and this. And, and, and the great it, artists are the ones who didn't. You know, right. you look at Carpeau. He was, right. he was absolutely walking the line you know he was yeah, he was in right. the educational system for 21 years his that's education unbelievable that's really yeah. and, and and what's the period of rome it's grad school another five years <laughs> know. you know and yeah. and but yeah, it was right. during that five years that he you know fought against the system and won and he yeah. fought hard and long and i yeah. mean he was met with resistance every step of the way right, right. but i do but, think that i do i do think that's a good lesson in that 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 you know it wasn't what you're saying is actually really really important to what you uh, and is germane to what you said about the the academic system of the 19th century in France that it could pump out people and it created a very disciplined approach to doing one thing that was that was appropriate for what was acceptable in society but his person it's you know he persevered to be able to do something of his something of his own and today is no different like yeah. it doesn't matter if you go to a school if people go to a school that, that they think offers them everything they're going to get, they're still going to have to get out into the world, persevere. So, so that perseverance, it is, is something that doesn't change. Um, and that's why, you know, talking about my own education and my own development is maybe will be helpful to some people because 
I have one figure modeling class in my life, in my in my educational life that I've that I've taken. That doesn't mean that 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 like oh that was all I needed like oh you know I got it you know right now no it's because you no. you sorted it out for yourself right right have you ever so, thought about writing a book or making instructional yeah, videos like so I many have, people do I have but but I just don't know when I'm gonna have the time to be totally honest yeah. it's just so hard to do I don't yeah. have time I'm you know I'm teaching I, I you know I have a full time teaching job in the university teaching workshops in Rome I you know have my own work that I'm making. I I I can't do everything as it is. I'm 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 constantly playing catch up, mm. and to add something else to that mix would be I think would oh well, it'd be suicide. I couldn't do it. Yeah. I simply couldn't do it. But I have thought about it because, you know, I've been a bit of a magpie, you know, collecting from here and there, and um, and my own experience is is, you know, is a um, is learning to be a factotum as of sculpture because I have to. I do, you know, I do my own cat. I do my own bronze work. I do. I've learned to do a lot of different things. I've had to. I think that creates an interesting way of making sculpture because I didn't go through any kind of system, atelier system or whatever. I I picked up lots of different things from whatever it might be, from Lanteri or from friends or people that I followed, or just like I said, reverse engineering based on what I saw other you know people in the past doing. And uh, so, but that perseverance is the same, is the same because I didn't have that. I didn't have, I have one, one class of, of figure modeling as an, as a student that I didn't even remember learning anything. in. It was just, <laughs> like, it was just like, what do you, what do we, so we start modeling in the morning. The teacher comes in and comes back like a few hours later. And like, but I, I don't, you know, one of the interesting things about the kind of education that you and I have had because we've had to piece it together from lots of sources, I think it makes it actually can if it can make you a better teacher doing that. Absolutely. Because I don't have a single system. People want to know like, okay, how do I do? Like, give, tell me your system for making a for making a figure, or for teach me a, a system for making a figure. Um, and so I don't have like a single methodology like that. I'm a an advocate of like. This is the right way to model. That's you know like I think the teliers need that because they because it's good for it's good for their it's good for their system for their advertising and for in terms of reproducing uh, 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 a level of quality. Sure, I mean that's students. the difference between a school and a and a professional artist. I Precisely, mean, you, you need to have that. You know, you're not much of an atelier Precisely. if you just say, well, you know, find your own way. Right. You know, Precisely, like, I mean it has to be, it has to be something for? you can pass on. Yeah, yeah, but I but I my approach with students is I I, I assume. And I think correctly assume that everyone comes into a class with different set of preconceived notions about what the body looks like, sure, and a different set of preconceptions about how to make it. And your job is to break that down, exactly. Yeah, yeah and yeah. and if it requires me taking a pair of calipers and saying you need to measure this because you're you need to you need to get in your head these proportions, and I want you to see them by measuring them. If it requires that, I'll do it. Hmm. If on the other hand they come in and they just like measure everything and they're not looking. I'll say you need to put the calipers down and start looking. So I'm very adaptable because I I I'm sort of attuned to what people's habits are. That's the way I that's the way I because I had to that's the way I learned. I had to figure out on my own what my habits were and what my assumptions were about the body mm-hmm. and find ways to 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 subvert all of those. Do you do you, so. do you try to do that as much as possible or do you allow a little bit of your assumption and your bias to sort of um, linger because and here's here's my yeah. thinking is that basically style like what I what I sometimes tell my students is um, you know try as hard as you can to you know rid yourself of all assumptions uh, and you'll do a good job you'll fall short sure of of, of you know complete objectivity yeah. and it's that degree by which you fall short yeah. that's your style I totally agree with you I do agree with you I don't want to no that's it that's actually a really good point I'm glad you say that because I do not this is the tricky part about teaching. Like you want to you you on um, you want to break bad habits, but you don't want to break the individual. There's like there are certain, sometimes students do things that 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 make no sense. Like in some in a certain regard, right? You just like I don't know why you're doing that, but it's interesting. 
right? Mm-hmm. And I don't that's change the thing it. I don't want to lose. Right. I just want to give them better control of the things that they can they yeah. can do. And, and you that's almost a, that's and, a really difficult balance. Yeah, because you almost don't even want to point those things out because right. if you exactly. make it conscious, because they're doing right. it unconsciously. Right. But sometimes they'll be conscious of it and they don't like it. And and I'll and I'm usually saying, well, why don't you use that? Yeah, it doesn't look like the model, and it's kind of distorted and odd. But I like the oddity. Like if you could just control these other elements of how you're you're utilizing the material, you know, you don't lose that essential element, like you said, whatever it is, style or or a um, a formal a formal uh, schemata that they have, because mm-hmm. everybody has a schemata or, or a set of schemata that they have. Um, whatever those things are that make them interesting and unique, I don't want to get rid of those. I really can't. Like mm-hmm. I, I would hate it if I if I just made them all look the same because yeah, you don't want to beat out their individuality. Yeah. My, my, but it's, my... it's tricky because like what is a, what is a flaw yeah, in their exactly. what is what is their weakness and what is their style? Because right. it can because can be both. It can be both. It can yeah. be both. But I do I think generally speaking, my my approach to teaching is is to help them see their bad habits and eliminate them because habits have nothing to do with style. Habits are right. habits are. You know, they sit in the corner and they just don't even look at the model and just, but you know, whatever. Or they, or they, they just they um, don't move around. Right? Mm-hmm. That's a habit. That's a bad habit. Yeah, focus on one area too much. Yeah, to right. Other things undeveloped. Right. Yeah, not not exactly not paying attention to the overall composition. Working from general to specific, they should do that instead. Of, and, yeah. and instead, they work from specific to general. I'm like, that's a bad habit. Right? Yeah. Because that's a compositional principle that can apply to anything. Yeah, and that's that's a right. that's that's a matter of process rather than precisely than, than style. Precisely. Those, so those ha- I try to sure. try to find ways of eliminating the bad habits and replacing them with good ones. Brian Booth Craig's solo exhibition "Internal Variations, Figures, and Gestures" runs throughout April at the Bernarducci Meisel Gallery in New York. Oh, I want to thank you all for listening. And thanks once again to Brian Booth Craig for the fantastic interview. Now, don't forget to check out additional content at our YouTube channel for The Sculptor's Funeral and also on our Facebook group page. You can join in the conversation on Facebook and do the whole online networking thing with like-minded sculptors and sculpture lovers from all over the planet. And I've seen uh, this week at the Facebook group page, uh, several people have gone to Brian's exhibition, have taken photos, and have posted uh, images of the exhibition opening at the Facebook group page, The Sculptor's Funeral. So you can, so if you can't make it to Brian's show, you can check it out. You can check it out there. And don't forget, you can go to our website, thesculptorsfuneral.com where you can not only listen to the entire back catalog of episodes, you can also visit the image galleries for this and other episodes. And while you're there at thesculptorsfuneral.com, you can click on the Blick Art Supplies link, which takes you to the Blick Art Supplies website, where you can support the podcast simply by buying from Blick. And for that, I thank you. Thanks again for listening, and have a productive week.